So welcome everyone. My name is Chuck Warpa Husky. I am the project director here at Michigan Collaborative to End Mass Incarceration. And I am so excited that you are all with us today for this session on how to use language within media to shape perception and policy. We have had a great response to this webinar. So many people are eager and excited about this because you are all doing amazing work to help end mass incarceration from advocacy to direct service to arts. You're out there helping to stop this problem, this program that is doing tremendous damage to our communities, especially black and brown communities, wasting taxpayer dollars and undermining public safety. And one question I hear all the time from advocates like you is, what is the right language we should be using? Should I be saying criminal legal system, criminal justice system? What is the right way? And so with our partners at Piper and Gold, we put together this webinar, next slide please, to help you be more effective. You know, sometimes when we talk about language, some people have the, the worry, oh, if I say the wrong thing, am I gonna get canceled? Well, don't worry, this is not about canceling you. This is about you being more effective and impactful and respectful. So if you choose to use different words, we respect that. But we believe that if when we're aligned around the words we use, we can be more effective at trying to change our system, trying to change policies and create a system uh, community that works for everyone. And that's what Michigan Collaborative 10 Mass Incarceration is here to do. We are here to help promote policies that help, um, so we've got organizations from across the state of Michigan that are doing that frontline work, often on their own. So Michigan Collaborative to End Mass Incarceration, we are here to help all those different organizations work together to be more effective together than they can be on their own. This can be through improving coordination on shared policy goals. This can by, be by developing shared resources such as this webinar. It can be through <laughs> relationship building, but across all the organizations that are working to end mass incarceration in Michigan, our job is to help you be more effective together than you can be on your own. So one way that you can help join our effort is if you have not yet done so already, please join my semi. We don't charge any money for it. It's not about trying to get uh, resources from you, but we believe that when we can stand up to policymakers and show strength in numbers, we could be more effective. And I just dropped the link for you to do that in the chat. Leading us through today's webinar is the amazing Kate Snyder. Kate is the CEO at Piper and Gold, a communications firm, the communications firm that was introduced to us by one of our members, the National Association of Social Workers. And we heard about the amazing things that NASW is doing for, that Piper and Gold was doing for NASW. And they've done amazing work for us too, both in terms of helping get our message out. So if we're talking about re-entry and we need to get a, an op-ed placed in a specific media market, they've been here to do that, as well as to help us think through at a bigger picture, how to be strategic and intentional on our communication. So Kate, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Chuck. I am so excited to be here with you today. I started my uh, career within the criminal legal system, communications, um, back in 2004, five, six era, when I had the opportunity to work at one of the pilot sites for um, the Michigan Prisoner Reentry Initiative and support on communications with that pilot site um, on kind of the national attention it, it garnered when it first started here. And so it has spurred within me a lifelong passion um, and, and really direct connection with working within the criminal legal system and supporting through communications and how we can change narratives and perceptions surrounding the criminal legal system and incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people. So. I'm really excited today. I get to facilitate our phenomenal panel and then share with you a little bit of information about the glossary and how to utilize it. So to start today, we have three fantastic guest panelists who are going to answer some questions for us. You can ask questions in the chat. Um, so please feel free to post your questions for the panelists in the chat. Um, and then I'm also going to ask him some questions as well, so we don't have that awkward silence moment while folks wait to think of questions. Um, but first, I'm going to introduce them. So first up, Jason 
Jason Smith um, is with the Michigan Center for Youth Justice, where he serves as the executive director. And Jason started his career in the field of juvenile justice as an intern with the Ingham County Circuit Courts Family Division. He uh, then, after his graduation from Michigan State, went on to work as a direct care provider um, and then within the Wayne County Juvenile Justice System. And then while working on his Master's of Social Work, master of social work. I need to make sure I'm using my correct terminology there. Um, at the University of Michigan, he also interned with the Washtenaw County Michigan Prisoner Reentry Initiative and uh, Michigan Center for Youth Justice. Our team has had an amazing chance to work with Jason um, on some of the media work. He is uh, just a phenomenal, phenomenal um, thought thought leader and expert in talking about juvenile justice within the state of Michigan and beyond. Um, and I'm really excited he's going to be here to answer some of our questions today. So Jason, thank you. Next up, we have got Alexandra Bailey. Um, Alexandra uh, is... Um, what, what's that? Oh, sorry. Oh. Uh -huh. All right, someone play the go mute the person that's unmuted game. All right, so Alexander <laughs> Bailey, our senior campaign strategist. I mean, that is largely why I wear a hat all the time is because I start other, my day in the cold. Um, titles. Um, she uh, has, uh, I like can't even distill it down, Alexandra, sorry. But okay, and so I'm just going to read it because it's so good. In supporting state and local advocates working to challenge the nation's life sentencing laws, Alexandra Bailey's priorities include supporting efforts to end life without parole, capping maximum penalties at 20 years, promoting second look provisions, and fostering a culture shift that rejects excessive punishments in favor of restorative approaches to public safety. Prior to joining the sentencing project, Bailey was a campaign strategist and national organizing specialist for the ACLU and a coordinator for the Women's March in Chicago. She is also an advisory commissioner in Washington, D.C.'s Ward 2. So incredibly excited to have Alexandra here with us today. And then last but not least, we have Josh Ho, um, who is the new policy manager at dream.org. Uh, formerly incarcerated himself, Josh has been a policy analyst, a social media and messaging consultant, an organizer, and is the host and creator of the Decarceration Nation podcast, which is now in its sixth season. Josh has the background in public speaking, debate, and public policy research, and he uh, holds a master's in international relations. He's also a former national college debate champion, so I will not be um, uh, playing devil's advocate in any way with him today, and a longtime college debate coach. So Josh, thank you for being here with us today. So with that, um, again, if you would like to ask questions for our panelists, uh, go ahead and pop those in the chat and Cozine or uh, Chuck, feel free to interrupt us. Uh, I'll try to keep an eye, but also feel free to interrupt us and pop those out there. Um, for anyone that is one of those note taker kind of folks, don't worry. We are recording today's session and then any statistics, articles, or other um, links and resources, we will share those out as a part of the notes with the presentation. So you can just focus on listening and learning today and you won't have to feverishly try to take all the notes while you get to listen and engage. So with that, let's start out. Um, talk to us a little bit about how the language used in media narratives shapes public perception. I mean, that is what we are here to talk about today. So just let's let's talk a little bit about that on the macro level. How do those narratives about the criminal legal system shape how people view and perceive it? Okay, I'm gonna call on people. Alexandra, it's your turn. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're having trouble getting unmuted. Just kidding. There we go. Okay. There we go. Okay. Uh, sure. Absolutely. Uh, pick on me. 
<laughs> not a problem. So I think um, one of the, the major things is that we don't situate things within proposed solutions within the broader historical uh, geographic context of which they are happening. There's an incredible sensationalization um, as well as an outrage industrial complex that has been created um, around what is a false narrative, what is um, often not a factually true narrative. So in, in most of the country, crime rates reached their peak levels in the 1990s and since then have been near record lows before certain crimes began to creep up in 2020 when we had a massive global pandemic that changed the shape of everything. And so rather than placing anything within the historical context to show what people are concerned about now as an outlier in a trend that has been progressively positive, um, what we have been doing is taking things out of their context out of their larger historical narrative and using them to sell papers at the expense of black and brown lives, at the expense of driving mass incarceration, um, at the expense of community. And that is a massive, massive problem that we really need to get a hold of when it comes to public narrative. I mean, so many years ago, you know, politicians figured out and press figured out that you can make a lot more money and you can sell a lot more papers and you can get a lot more attention if you uh, fear monger about crime issues. And so, you know, we've seen since the Willie Horton ad many years ago, that become kind of a central feature of what we see, especially during uh, election cycles. Uh, I think we just saw uh, an election cycle that ended relatively relatively recently that was pretty much dominated by uh, you know very pejorative kind of language about crime, about people who are incarcerated, about people who are formerly incarcerated, about what people need to do to protect themselves from all of those kinds of folks. And you know when I first uh, encountered this, you know as a formerly incarcerated person, uh, I started reading some of the, 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 the research around this. And, you know, what most of that research concludes, uh, the language-based research, is that when you start to talk about people in those kind of, uh, in words that create, uh, that activate the fear centers in people's brains, then that is how people react going forward to anyone who's in those categories that are described in those publications. And so when they see some of the language, uh, that becomes how they relate with people down the road. It's not really about like cancel culture or anything like that. It's about creating relationships through the way you describe people that go forward in people's lives. And I guess I would just say, you know, that we've seen the end result of that. I mean, just recently last week, you know, uh, President Biden decided not to veto the D.C., uh, the change of the D.C. code that the legislature was trying to do. Uh, and if you look at the press, just if you read just kind of random headlines and, read, you know, like USA Today, crazy crime law, why Democrats are fighting about a D.C. code. You have representatives talking about how it's a giveaway to, uh, yeah, uh, to coddle criminals and to uh, appease violent criminals. And then you have, you know, people, and this is just, you know, we we're, we live in a media environment and I'm going a little longer than I normally would where, you know, for instance, every police department has their own media department where mm -hmm. every, I mean, all of these people are working together in a sense to continue a narrative that is profitable and good for them. Uh, and I'll pass it to Jason. No, well, well said, uh, but, but you and Alexandra. Um, just from the youth justice perspective, um, I feel like there's uh, two, two major issues in, in the uh, predominant uh, narrative of young people uh, in relation to uh, crime in, in the juvenile justice system. One, I think, builds on uh, what Josh and Alexander has already said beyond the, the general conversation of, of criminal justice. And whenever there's conversations about crime, I think often you see um, youth crime being viewed um, very harshly um, historically, uh, uh, we've seen situations where the narrative have been uh, the media narrative has been used to 
over criminalize youth, treat youth people, uh, youth young, or young people in the adult system. Um, but also, it, it's interesting, you know, our juvenile justice system is, is on paper, is supposed to be uh, treatment focused, treatment based and rehabilitative. Um, for example, young people in the juvenile justice system aren't uh, sentenced to, to prison time or, or you know, specific uh, target dates and, and placement, they're court ordered to receive treatment. And so on paper, the focus of the juvenile justice system is, treat is treatment. And unfortunately, that narrative, um, even though it, it does not always <laughs> turn out that way, has been used to justify system involvement for youth, primarily young poor people and, and young kids of color. Um, often the narrative is, is such that young people um, who need some sort of treatment or services can't get it without involvement in the legal system. I mean, I can't tell you how many parents I've talked to over the years who have said that they've actually been encouraged to uh, have their young person involved with the juvenile justice system to get treatment that they couldn't get otherwise. Now that you know speaks to problems along the, the the continuum of services that kids can participate in before their justice involved. But still, that narrative, you know, one that um, that these kids somehow need to be in the the system, and two, this is where they that the the services, the best services they could possibly get to address their needs uh, are actually accessible is, is really problematic. And you see that um, played out in, in examples. I know we're trying to keep it broad based, but just even um, right now, there's a, a, a large conversation around the use of out-of-home placement, residential facilities here in Michigan, and those opening and closing and uh, the needs for beds and et cetera. You know, um, th th there's a ju justification out there that these young folks, based on their crimes or where they sit, actually uh, need residential tra treatment. And that, like, they d even if it's low quality or there's issues with safety violations or concerns within those facilities that, you know, if not careful, you know, the narrative can be framed that they almost somewhat deserve it. Or, you know, uh, these facilities are too big to fail. And so... <laughs> uh, given the, the situation that kids find themselves in, whether they're unsafe or not, we need them. And so we better, you know, make them work than not. Well, can I just add one thing here, Kate? I mean, so this is, the, this is also like the massive thing that I was talking about at the beginning between what is actually true and what is reported. We need to recognize the limited and declining role of youth crimes. The reality the truth is, is that people ages 17 and under were 7% of arrests nationwide in 2019, which is our most recent data. That's down 15%. From, from a little more than a decade before. We're trending in the right direction when it comes to youth. And yet every newspaper you pick up, particularly in Washington, DC, around the criminal code adjustment, which was a 10 year project taken on by community and experts that was basically washed away um, almost as if it was nothing based on a false narrative about youth crime and in particular carjacking, um, which, it's so incredibly detrimental, but shows the power and the problem of what we're dealing with. So let's talk a little bit more about, um, Josh, you mentioned the fear mongering, Alexandra, the data, Jason, the way in which these narratives falsely represent the reality. What media narratives do you want to see so that people can better understand and how can we help people start to better understand and better empathize and um and really see the accurate data but also the humans behind that we probably could just start with ampl with like not amplifying unsupported claims. Let's fact check the police prosecutors and legislators. Let's just start there. Accuracy in reporting would take us a long way before we even bother to humanize it. Yeah, I mean, I think Alexander's right that, you know, I mean, yeah, I did a lot of work over the last couple of years, uh, trying to respond to uh, the bail reform discussion in New York, in every single one of the, you know, 
probably thousands of articles that just the New York Post put out, I can tell you in a very short amount of time what's wrong with the data that they claim to use when they even claim to use data in most of their articles. But unfortunately, they, you know, they're writing, you know, with heavy ink, and we're maybe getting in there occasionally in pencil. And, you know, we have to find ways to be more effective at finding or or being allowed in the spaces where those discussions are happening, not just in correcting the narratives, because we can't even get to the point where we're correcting the narratives until we have space in those discussions. And while our movement has been growing and, and it's successful over the last you know two decades in particular, uh, we have not been able to solve largely, in my opinion, that problem uh, that we face, which is getting at least even getting counter narrative in the space. If I yeah, just quickly add, I, I agree with both points, um, just uh, building on the piece about data, like just having better information about the kid, again, especially for youth justice, knowing what uh, young people are in the system, demographic data can make go a long way. We've been successful, those who advocate for justice reform, I would say on the youth and the adult side, and doing so with very little data uh, to, to, you know, build up our argument strongly. And I, I think for really digging into specific issues like racial disparities or unnecessary system involvement, you have to have the data to dig into to to to, to highlight for for justice stakeholders that you know here are the kids, uh, here are the people, but here are the kids that are uh, being uh, placed in the system. You know who needs to be here, who's not, who doesn't, um, along the, the the spectrum, including out of placement. Who actually. Uh, has to be in, in an out-of-home facility. We we uh, assume very few or a very small percentage of the kids that come in contact with the justice system. But if not, you know, what are the programs uh, before and after a kid comes in contact with the system that can really address their needs? Some specific, some broad, but uh, data can really help to to shape the narrative, and it should for all of us, advocates, stakeholders, and and the media telling these stories too. I think I would also say that we need to. We have to put a human subject at the center of these things, and we have to make people less objects and more subjects. Uh, you know, if if I call someone, like I said before, when I was talking about research, if I call someone a felon or a criminal or a coddled criminal, or you know, I'm defining everything that they can ever be in that term, I'm not leaving them any space for anything else. And the last thing any of us want is for someone to come back like myself from incarceration and feel like the only thing I can ever be is, 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 is someone who's a criminal. Uh, when I take away, when all the possibilities are taken away from me aside from the possibility of doing something bad, you know, that kind of death, radical desperation starts to set in. And that's why I think a lot of people do go back to what they're doing and why I think it's so important that we center uh, possibility and humanity in, in, in the narratives that we put out there in addition to data and a lot of other things. Well, I mean, also in addition to which, I mean, we need to talk about how we're portraying people right? I mean, even the, the mug shots that uh, mug shots are mostly shown of black and brown people in almost all news cycles. Um, the posture in which um, news, news takes, I mean, the, the super predator narrative was tragically successful. Um, and it continues to be successful to the detriment of everyone who is involved. And if every news station in America was required to do an audit of both the quantity and quality of its crime coverage as a requirement, I think we would be stunned and shocked at, that it's even worse than what we think it is. Yeah. Um, part of the intent of the glossary and, and part of today's conversation is to come together around common language and perfect as it may be for that narrative shaping and, and the impact of repetition and of consistency in language. Can you talk a little bit about um, sort of how you feel about that that repetition and collective impact in language and where it should be most focused to really create those shifts that we need to see happen. You know, it's it's a 
it's a complicated thing because I'm, I'm not always con- I'm not always convinced that it is a particular use of language, but kind of the spirit of the use of the language. And that's why I talked about subject object and about treating people with humanity. Uh, because you can use any combinations of words. It's the way that you use them that probably determines how people see them. Uh, and, you know, there's another complicating factor. You know, I often say when people ask me about this, that people who are directly impacted have earned the right to call themselves whatever they want to call themselves. You know, if I want to call myself as someone who's done time a felon, then I can do that. And I should be able to do that because much in the same way any other oppressed class gets to, you know, use the words of the oppressor against them, you know, you can't foreclose people from using the words that feel right to them. But at the same time, the people using those words are probably not going to use them in a way that uh, you know, largely demeans everyone who's ever ex- experienced any of those things. And so I think it's a it's a complicated process. I do think that for people who aren't directly impacted, getting a good set of terms that are considered not to be uh, uh, pejorative or insulting uh, is probably a good thing. And I wish uh, more 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 folks would engage in that. And, you know, I often get when I get in these discussions, someone will say something, well, that's the dex- dictionary definition of the word. If you have a felony, you're a felon. And I'm like, yeah, but the point of writing is not just to put dictionary words in a page, it's to, to talk to people about a situation and explain and, and give power to it and meaning to it and to show the 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 nuance and the and the and, and the shades, not just the the word, you know, just what the dictionary definition of a word is or something like that. And on the flip side of that, accurately presenting what crime victims and survivors, there's a complexity of views. There is very much a binary about like these people are the villains and these people are the victims. And it's so not true. And as somebody who spends a lot of time with and is a survivor of violent crime, I really hate this narrative. It actually usurps the power of people who survive crime. They do. Many of us do not want perpetual punishment. We don't want people talked about this way because very frequently those are people who are part of our communities. And that doesn't help our community. It doesn't help us as women. It doesn't help us as black and brown people. It is hyper problematic. And when you attempt to correct them, you actually will get pushback, even though prosecutors and news cycles will claim 100% that they are out there putting out the narrative of the crime victim, when actually they can be one of the most traumatizing, stigmatizing factors that usurps people's survivorship and their desire for what they want the criminal legal system to do. I think one of the most important things that as communicators, we can internalize and emphasize is that recognition that no community is a monolith and that while collective impact, consistency in language and terms are very important and can have power, we also have to respect individuals' choices. And we should really normalize the conversation of how do you describe yourself? Or how do you describe your situation? How do you describe your circumstance? What what would you like us to say? What are the words you want us to use? And make it, whether that's talking about race, gender, criminal legal system involvement, whatever it may be, I think we need to to really get used to simply saying, what's your preference? Hey, what's your preference? And respecting that. And in the absence of that, or in the absence of an individual, you know, when someone says, oh, I don't, I'm, that's not something I care a ton about, then we look at the, at the ways we can be consistent. We had a question from the audience, and I'm going to pop to you first, Jason, on this, um, since you didn't get a chance to answer on the last one. So we had a question about, like, what do we do in terms of evolve? And, like, kind of what are some of those historical evolutions of language that you've seen and of narrative that you've seen? And both for the better, but also for the worse. And how do we um, acknowledge and address some of those, or what are some of those that you've seen in particular within the juvenile justice realm?
Jason, it can be a struggle to unmute yourself. <laughs> yes, yeah, I just noticed. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, uh, we made a name change uh, for our organization. For most of our org's history, and, and we're a 60 plus year old organization, the name was the Michigan Council on uh, Crime and Delinquency. And we intentionally shifted our name uh, to the Michigan Center for Youth Justice, one, to like really lift up that we wanted to be a youth justice focused org, but also to uh, we recognize that that term delinquency has has evolved. People have shifted away from using that to describe young people who come in contact with the justice system. And again, it's a part of our ongoing work to shift the conversation about what even youth justice is. Um, uh, should it be a place where young people's uh, involvement is limited to uh, re repairing harm to a victim or because there's some sort of public safety concern and they need supervision for an interim a little bit or is it a situation where young people who solely have needs that need to be addressed are getting those services met through the legal system we don't think that that's the case and so whatever we can to shift that narrative to say that you know these are not you know these are young people kids who really just need support it's a family focused support or community focused support given that their kids you know still a part of dependent family units often um, that it cannot just be a, a focus of, you know, criminal justice uh, in, in the traditional sense. So um, it, th that's really our focus as much as possible is to to ch change, make sure that the system, as much as needs to exist, uh, really reflects what it should on, on paper. And that all the language, all the narrative around that aligns with that mindset that, you know, you, you actually do improve public safety and reduce recidivism and yield outcomes when you're treatment focused with kids. Well, I mean, this this narrative, this this language, it has a massive impact. One of the states of the sentencing project is working in is Oklahoma. And I was talking to all of the groups that provide direct services for survivors of domestic violence. And they also provide the victim fund, which most states have that when you're a survivor of crime, there's a fund that you can apply to to receive things for funeral costs and other things. And what they shared with me is that there was not a single Black recipient from that fund in the prior year. Not a single Black recipient from that fund, not one. And the reason for that, somebody actually said publicly, is that because that community is part of the problem, and therefore, they are not worthy of access to what your taxpayer dollars are, are funding, right? And it is because of a pervasive and continuous narrative that Black people are somehow more violent, uh, larger perpetrators of crime, so on and so forth. That that mother who lost her child, well, he was gang involved. Therefore, she, she should be left with absolutely nothing and no support from the state. This is the actual cost of these types of narratives. Um, and in a state like that, which is one of the number one states for domestic violence, it is a state where one out of every two women will experience it in her life, and 42% of men will experience it. They're just getting to the point of understanding the concept of a criminalized survivor, and it's the first time they've ever had it perpetually talked about in that way, which is a massive growth point, which is really great to see. But this is also a state that leads the nation in the incarceration of criminalized survivors. Um, and so, you know, these, these narratives are dangerous and they have real impact. And I really think people need to get that. The rubber actually meets the road with things that they say in the news media. I have zero poker face, zero. So hope it's shocking. It is shocking. I hope y'all appreciated me wanting to set things on fire. <laughs> uh, we did have another question. <laughs> The um, talking about Michigan and is Michigan spearheading its own reform efforts or are the is there another major metropolitan or state that we're modeling ourselves after? And Chuck, feel free to chime in here on the my semi front as well if there's anything you want to add on that one. Thank you, Kate. So uh, the question sound, from the question sound like there were two parts of that. One, we've so as we'll get into in a little bit, as a resource for you, 
to help choose language appropriately with the caveat that Josh and others highlighted, we will respect people's ability to define themselves. Putting that to, that resource together, we looked at national uh, research, national best practices. We tested with the ground truth by checking in with advocates here in Michigan who are on the front lines of effective language. So it is a we believe this resource is useful nationally. Uh, we pulled in from a lot of different national partners to generate it, and it is it is um, something that um, that was our process there. In terms of the specific policy. Criminal legal system policy happens at the local, state, and national level. Uh, Michigan Collaborative 10 Mass Incarceration is focused on supporting organizations within Michigan at that state and local level. Uh, in a moment, I'll drop a link to the chat about some of the things that we anticipate being in the pipeline. And there's great national uh, partners in a, every corner of the country doing work, like the Sentencing Project and their, their network of uh, accomplices across the country. I like the term accomplices. That feels good. I like that. I like that terminology. <laughs> okay, so I can't believe this, but we're actually coming close to our time on our <laughs> panel. Um, so I want to pose this question uh, in case it's our last one. Um, but what are some of the specific terms or stories, narratives that you come across that you find are either the most harmful, like you, Alexander, you give that, you know, face breaking uh, example. What are some of the things you find are the most harmful um, that, that we collectively can work to address as a high priority or the ones that just kind of raise your hackles the most? I'm actually gonna let Josh go first on this because I'm like looking at his face. <laughs> yeah, Josh has got thoughts. Josh has thoughts. Oh, Somebody hey, unmute God, him. Josh, <laughs> unmute the man. You can go to town. Yeah, sorry, there was an unmute problem again. Uh, <laughs> You know, uh, right now, the thing that I think is the most troubling to me, uh, I believe there's a confluence of events that have happened where we're going back to the 90s, where the Democrats are going to be pushing the Republicans to see who can go farthest on uh, right on, on tough on crime. And the main place <clears throat> where that's playing out uh, seems to be in sentencing. And there's kind of a lot of uh, a lot of a uh, agreement I'm seeing across press and a lot of other things on the idea that sentencing is it addresses crime. And I've been asking over and over again, why? <laughs> you know, uh, you know, that's not necessarily a language thing, but it, it's certainly something that I'm seeing more and more, and it will affect more and more people and needs to be called out, in my opinion, more and more, because sentencing really has almost nothing to do with crime. If you're going to line up the top 100 ways to reduce crime, sentencing wouldn't even make the list. Uh, and I'd be more than willing to to demonstrate that with with data and all kinds of other things. But in this kind of form, it's not. I do want to say one cautionary tale, uh, just real quick. I have a friend who's a, a reporter in this area, used to be at the Marshall Project, now at the LA Times. And one of the things she says is that, you know, and this is why I talked a lot, I think, earlier about the notion that we have to be careful about the intentionality of what we do more than the particular words. And what she says is that a lot of times, if she, you know, in the places she's worked, like Texas and other places like that, if she doesn't use some of the traditional terms in her attempt to break down things, that people will almost uh, think, you know, for lack of a better term, think it's like, oh, it's that kind of reporting and will kind of dismiss it. And so a way to get in the discussion is to use terms that people will listen to, but then try to break them down in the way that you write the stories. And so I think it's all very complicated and and, and, and something that's going to require nuance and thought going forward. And I'm sorry if that wasn't a direct answer to language on the first part, but I do think that's the thing we that's going to impact us the most. I mean, we're seeing states across the country go to truth and sentencing. Uh, which, as we know in Michigan, has been a terrible, terrible thing. Where you know, with fentanyl and things like that, we're seeing every state trying to put more mandatory minimums into effect, more kinds of sentencing enhancements. Uh, I just think this is something that we really need to be aware of and really fight back against uh, as hard as possible right now. Absolutely. Um. Uh, yeah, I can add quickly that um, 
you you know just just to uh, tag on to Josh's point that there are terms times when common terms are are useful, especially depending on who you're talking to, policymakers or stakeholders. One example is that um, if I'm talking generally about the the juvenile justice system, I will use that term, juvenile justice system, and and explain when I'm talking to specific people. But if I'm trying to drive home the point that I made today about it not being used for services, you know, I'll drive home the point that it's the legal system and that you shouldn't be in the legal system just to get services alone. So I'll, I'll make that difference, you know, if it has an impact in, in language or conversations. But again, just the, the most impactful narrative uh, piece that really, you know, shapes our work is just sensationalizing uh, youth offenses or youth, youth crimes to somehow justify, you know, overly punitive measures to, to address them and not really looking at it as uh, kids in need or communities in need, um, rather just uh, using the, the, the crime or the offense, the alleged offense to justify confinement, incarceration or whatever, uh, adultification. I would say question everything that you read. Um, really take a look into what terms and laws actually do. Like, for example, failure to protect, right? That sounds like a law that if you fail to protect a kid, you get in trouble for it. The way that that is actually used across the country is to put often people who are surviving violence in their own home where children also get hurt into prison for something that they couldn't control. Right. So things sound really good when you read it in the paper. Scrutinize everything and stick with news outlets that are consistent, fair and more even in their reporting who stay away from that type of terminology. And if there is call out your local news outlet. I put the media do's and don'ts into the chat. I know like, call them out right into them, call into them and say, hey, knock it off. You know, this is ridiculous. And we also live in a time where this doesn't go away. So, you know, even when they think about what they're reporting on and what they're showing, that permanently affects that person's life. And I think that's very true in the youth context. Um, and that is something that takes away someone's entire life following that. So I really think we collectively need to get into the call out culture as opposed to the cancel culture. And I think depending on your, um, I'm just going to build off this, Alexander, because this is one I'm really personally passionate about, uh, depending on your personal personal approach, personal take on things. You know, I started my career in print journalism, right? So my very first job in communications was as a print reporter. And I had no idea what I was doing, just like everyone in their first job. And journalism is a tough field. It is a hard life. <laughs> There's a reason that PR firms like mine are filled with former journalists who have <laughs> left the industry. And so I think too, that presumption of positive intent or um, approaching it from a place of truly, these are people that have been raised in a culture of bias, that have been raised with these same narratives, and they're not always intentionally perpetuating. There's a lot of times it's a 22 year old reporter or a 20 year old intern doing the reporting and they just genuinely don't know any better. So part of our role can be to do that call out, to do that correction and to follow it with education. Like here's the why that uh, the sentencing projects do's and don'ts. I love that piece. Recommend everybody download that and utilize that. It's one of the things we looked at a ton as we were working on the glossary. Um, but really thinking of that coming from an educational standpoint and how can you approach it in a way that doesn't come across as that condescending a-hole, but also recognizes the realities of media today that a lot of times, um, you know, they are working heavily under-resourced, particularly on those local levels, right? National should know better, but those local levels, um, it's a hard life. <laughs> okay, we're going to do our, our final question. Jason, we uh, will start with you. A great question we had here. Oh, let me find it. Let me find it real quick. Sorry. Okay. In a day and age where our media is everywhere, is it possible to find non-biased media so sources 
and what would you recommend? So I recognize probably not a lot of non-biased or unbiased media, but who's doing a good job? Who, who's doing a good job of breaking the stereotypes, of telling the stories, of helping people understand? Mm. Well, if, if you want a, a good bias source, uh, please use uh, check out our website and, our, and sign up for our newsletter. Uh, we'll definitely uh, give you a, a good perspective on the juvenile justice system here in Michigan. But um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I've seen, you know, uh, and contributed to articles in youth justice um, in, in the Detroit Free Press and the Detroit News are really, you know, depends reporter to reporter, kind of the point you were just making, Kate. But there are some great ProPublica uh, in the past has done some excellent reporting around juvenile justice, really digging into issues, looking at data, as much data as we have, as sparse as it is, um, and really doing their due diligence to talk to um, people impacted by the system and the range of stakeholders. Um, there are some good sources out there. Uh, there's a, a, a national um, site called the Juvenile Justice Information Exchange that does uh, really great uh, stories related to juvenile justice. Um, just really have to dig out there. And, and again, you know, we, and I know all of our partners try to uplift um, well-framed stories, well-framed articles around relevant policy issues as much as possible. Uh, yeah, so I would, uh... You know, I, I tend to think, I, you know, I don't mean to go all super postmodern here, but I uh, I would tend to think that, you know, there really isn't such a thing as an unbiased source. I mean, I think the question is really more about uh, what you're hoping to get out of a story. And so I think you have to ask yourself questions when you're reading stories, I think, more than anything else. And I think there's some reporters who do a better job and some reporters that don't. I think a lot of people, as you mentioned, are very resource constrained. And the easiest thing for them to do is just to quote, you know, press releases from prosecutors and police. Because they're there, they're there immediately, they don't have to do a lot of investigation, and they've got six stories they're trying to get out during the day. But there's some people at almost every publication who do a really good job and, and really work very hard at what they do to try to get things out. And so what I would think about more is uh, less about what source it is and more about how the people are treated in that story. Do they have nuance? Uh, are they asking the right questions? Is, you know, is there any data backing up any of the things that they're saying? Uh, you know, a lot of times I'll just stop reading after the first like three paragraphs if they make a bunch of accusations about crime and then don't back it up without any with any detail. And some have that's how I can kind of, you know, guess of which sources I'm going to listen to or which ones I don't. Uh, so I don't know if there's any particular source, although I'll always plug because uh, uh, I have a lot of friends at the Marshall Project. I'll always plug their work. Absolutely. And the Marshall Project is is a great source. I agree with ProPublica, and I completely agree with what with what Josh has to say. I mean, I think, like I said, scrutinize everything, go through, and really look at the angle from which and and like, I mean, what is this trying to do? What is this article trying to do? Um, and I think that's the thing that you always have to ask yourself, whatever source that it's coming from. But then also, I'm very conscientious about who owns newspapers. Um, and the their political affiliations, which is often like a very real thing um, that you kind of have to take a look at. And so I often read pieces to get people's take on things, not because I think it's the most accurate. If I want accurate data about extreme sentencing, I go to the sentencingproject.org or I go across the hall to Nazgul Gatnush, um, who, who's one, who's, you know, or Ashley Nellis, our, our heads of research. Um, but also I have to plug podcasts like Josh's, like the Defenseless podcast. There's a lot of really great folks that are getting into this um, who talk about particular things in a full historic context with a guest on who's an expert in that. And then you can really parse really good stuff from that and get a much bigger picture that when you go to re read a news article, um, you have a lot more context. Y'all, I know we could all listen to you all day, <laughs> but alas. <laughs> We've already taken you past when we told you we would. <laughs> so, and I know several of you have other commitments. So 
I just want to thank you so much for this conversation. Uh, maybe we'll have to do a part two because truly I, I could just sit here and listen. I could just say, go, just talk amongst yourselves and spill some tea and listen. Um, we appreciate your expertise and, and your thoughts so, so very much. So everyone, give me a round of virtual applause for Jason, Josh, and Alexandra for this amazing discussion with us. Uh, a couple of them are going to jet. I think Alexandra is going to stay because we have a part two. Um, technically, we go until 2.30 today, and we are going to move into talking a little bit more about the glossary and how you can utilize that tool and some additional resources. So a lot of things I heard in today's dialogue, um, I'm, I'm very excited about because we're about to talk about that. So if you need to run to the restroom, go run to the restroom. And um, we are going to hop right into that section. You're welcome to ask questions throughout. Um, and with that, ta-da. Thanks again to our panel, right? I mean, just holy, holy cow. Um, so, so grateful for that. Okay, so uh, we talked a little bit about that, like common language, is there unbiased media? Um, you know, as a former journalist myself, I do not believe we have unbiased media today, but there is, um, so mixed data about this, this need for common language. Okay. Um, so dirty word, Frank wants, um, if you don't know who he is, stay in blissful ignorance. Um, but he is a political consultant that focuses on language. And there's been a number of studies and we will link this in the notes we send you of how he utilizes language to change perception. The most notable being the shift from global warming to climate change. Um, also the uh, mind behind the term death tax instead of a state tax and um, you know, primarily works in the political realm. And a study of his utilization of language and policy. Uh, I'm gonna just kind of read you this little section um, from this study. It said, these studies illustrate that the many claims about language choice can be tested scientifically and objectively. So basically we can prove what language is more effective and how, how it shapes people's perceptions, but quite often such claims are justified simply on intuitive grounds, but are not evaluated by empirical data. Thus, as reasonable as these assertions might be, they just might be incorrect. So that's one of the things we do have to recognize and be willing to acknowledge as we look at how we're utilizing language and the common impact in that evolution of language throughout time is that we do our best, but there's no perfect solution. So I want to talk a little bit about, this is something that came up a lot during the panel, is this notion of what I would call asset framing. And I'm going to give you a non-criminal uh, legal system example here. So you know, we talk about how those negative narratives, those negative stereotypes. Well, some of the research we did early on for, um, for my semi was looking at the different audiences and the notion of how you speak to different audiences and who we're appealing to and what appeals to those individuals. And pretty much across the board, stories of triumph, stories of overcoming, um, that there's a reason that there are constantly TV shows, <clears throat> Ted Lasso, or, um, you know, movies and things about these underdog sports stories, right? People love a triumph story. And so when we're thinking about language and narrative, we have to think about how can that fit within talking about the criminal legal system and talking about incarcerated and formerly incarcerated people. And we call this shifting to asset framing. So I'm gonna read you two different letters that went out for the Ronald McDonald House of Mid-Michigan that looked at, um, they, they were a couple years apart, okay? So the first, the first letter was with this uh, little babe on the left with the pacifier. 
Claire and Lillian were born 10 weeks early and were fading fast. The Sparrow Health System neonatal intensive care unit was able to save Claire, but Lillian was unable to stay and was called home. The nurses at Sparrow suggested upon my release, we stay at the Ronald McDonald House of Michigan. So hard story, true story. But one thing that we realized was that we always knew how stories like this ended, right? We always knew when we were telling the stories that even though there was tragedy and fear, often as a part of that chronological storytelling, we knew that Claire was, uh, that Lillian was okay. And that the, the kid at the center of this story was okay. But our readers didn't know that, right? So they're going on this journey with this parent who's lost one child, who has one child in critical condition, and they have no idea. That's a very deficit-framed narrative. It's coming from a place of fear. It's coming from a place of panic. It's coming from a place of trauma. And it's making parents jump to the worst, right? Like, oh my gosh. And that's what we do a lot. And that's what the media does a lot in narratives surrounding the criminal legal system. Jump to a place of fear, fear mongering. What does it sound like to asset frame? So to asset frame, there was a very intentional choice to shift over how the stories were told and move out of that chronological, this was the moment of panic where everything started. And instead go to, today, Abiana is a happy, almost toddler who is always on the go. She enjoys swimming, making people laugh, playing with her sister and brothers and spending time with her NICU roommate, Samuel. But when she was born, her future was not so certain. It's a very simple shift, right? We start where the person is today and the, the triumph, the overcome, the success before we talk about what happened before. When we ask that frame, we can't ignore the past. That would be inauthentic. But what we can do is focus on the positive outcome first and then shift into all of the hardships, the injustices, the systemic issues. Um, I had a chance to work on a project for Advanced Peace Lansing, and it's a um, it's an initiative to reduce cyclical and retaliatory gun violence in Lansing and Ingham County. And part of what we did was analyze 67 articles that mentioned the initiative um, kind of prior to its launch and prior to our involvement. And in them, we found that more than a third of the articles, 36%, included gun violence in the first sentence or lead of the article in a deficit framing way. So either gun violence is up, telling the story of a shooting, telling the story of loss, that deficit framing. And nearly 100% of the articles cited gun violence statistics, which is natural for that program but people were already getting to them from that negative deficit framed perspective as opposed to that asset framed of there are people who have been involved in gun violence who are phenomenal humans making a difference. And so how we kind of, you know, shift that perception to asset framing can be a powerful tool in the use of the words. Okay, let's talk about the glossary. You'll get a copy of it with the um, follow-up from today. It's also on the My Summit website already. And um, this project, I am so excited to share because it went through lots and lots of research vetting, um, different groups looking at it, different individuals looking at it and weighing in. And we are so excited 
We know it's not perfect. It's an evolving document. We've already got a whole list of terms for part two. Um, but that being said, really excited to be able to share this with you. So the process included uh, nearly 50 different sources and combing through different articles, resource guides, language standards from across the country to look at what are the recommendations, what is the data surrounding what language to use, but then also making some judgment calls based on my semis goals and values so that collectively we can all come together to try to make a greater impact, shift over to this asset framing narrative, particularly when we're working with media. And we can, you know, have strength in numbers surrounding language so that we can support that more just, effective approach to talking about the narrative surrounding the criminal legal system. So collectively, our, our goals within this are to strategically shift that language that we all use surrounding uh, mass incarceration and really to dispel myths and misconceptions. So a lot of the language recommendations center around dispelling myths and misconceptions. These are considered kind of overarching recommendations for all my semi members and any of those who, if you aren't a member yet, please remember to join. Uh, but then also really anyone that that works within this realm and talks about it, as well as for reporters and media outlets. Um, we recognize that individual organizations are going to use different language on a case-by-case -case basis that better fits your values and your voice. That's okay. That's okay. Um, but when we can, we want to try to talk as a collaborative. Um, we also recognize that certain language might be a better fit for specific audiences or scenarios, and we've tried to accommodate for that. Um, and then we're really trying to point out some language terms, words, and phrases to avoid because of those harmful narratives that they do create. But again, we recognize that you always want to, you know, if you're working with an individual, if you're telling an individual story, their preference supersedes anything that happens in a glossary, right? Humans are humans. We have to respect that individual before we respect a document. So there are a couple different phrases we did want to walk through. The glossary has lots, lots, lots more. You're welcome to reach out if you have questions. Um, but when it relates to the overarching term of what do we call mass incarceration, <laughs> we're recommending mass incarceration. <laughs> of course, that's in alignment with my semi's name, but that's not why we picked it. Um, you know, the, the research really showed that this term was the kind of middle ground and the most neutral um, between things like mass punishment um, or um, some of the other terms that folks may choose to use uh, specifically with specific audiences or specific intents. But in general, my semi is recommending we say mass incarceration. But one thing I want to emphasize that you'll see throughout the glossary is whenever you can, use specificity. So this is a big problem we find whenever we're working with language, particularly language when people are afraid to get it wrong. So criminal legal system language, race, ethnicity, gender, anytime people are worried they're going to get it wrong or upset someone, um, we kind of start to default back to these biggest possible terms. But when you can, use specificity because people don't understand. That is one of our biggest challenges within talking about mass incarceration is that people don't, people don't know the difference between prison and jail. I actually um, don't remember how we got on the topic, but my six-year-old and I we're talking about, I said something about prison and he said, he asked like, mama, what is prison? And I had to explain to him the difference between prison and jail because he understood jail as a concept, but not prison. And, you know, I don't think my six-year-old is that far off from a lot of the public when it comes to understanding of these terms. So when you can, and when you need to use specificity um, rather than some of the broader terms. 
Now, this is one that I know not everyone is uh, going to agree upon, but we are recommending criminal legal system. Um, you can see the data and the research within. I think a lot of us can understand the some of the challenges with criminal justice system or the justice system or the legal system. Again, this is one where specificity makes the difference and really helps. When we say like the legal system, you have many people that could find confusion with, oh, are you talking about the court system? Are you talking about, you know, attorneys and judges? That when we think about who these terms are for, this is for general public education and understanding. We want to understand the people who vote into office, our policymakers. We want them to understand and we want to understand what they know. So criminal legal system kind of encompasses that full view and is meant to be that kind of catch-all um, and really defaulting to criminal legal system instead of interchanging it with legal system. And of course, incarcerated, formerly incarcerated. This is, you know, this is where we really get into so many of the nuances and how does an individual prefer to be referenced? But it also is where we come back to that people-centered language, focusing on humans, focusing on incarceration as a status, not as a, like, as a, not as an identity, but instead as a snapshot in time. Um, and how we can start to shift those perceptions to recognize and respect each individual's dignity, worth, their unique qualities, their strengths as a person. Um, those, those words are very, very important. Um, and I think Josh, you know, did a great job of illustrating that just personally when he was talking about it. So one of the things we hear a lot is justice system involvement. And we also hear returning citizen. And so when we looked at the data and did a lot of the vetting on this, we really wanted to help dispel myths or reduce the opportunity for misunderstanding or misinterpretation. So when we say person impacted by the justice system, is that um, you know someone who has had a crime, who has been the victim of a crime, then we even, that's, that's a whole other terminology that we just put on hold for part two of the glossary. <laughs> but, you know, like, is that, is that, you know, a person that was affected by the crime? Is that someone who was impacted by heavy handedness in their community by local police? Is that someone, um, is that a judge? Is that a prosecutor? Is that a district attorney? Who, is the person with justice system involvement. So for the sake of this is, you know, that specificity really helps with understanding. We hear it a lot within folks that, you know, work in the criminal legal system very frequently, but for those outside, the person with justice system involvement or person affected by the justice system, there may not be that understanding of who you're trying to talk about. So let's be more specific about it. And then with returning citizen, the research found that returning citizen or returning civilian is also a term that's used very frequently to reference veterans as they are transitioning out of their military, so active duty military service and into civilian life. And so that's another example where by using only the term returning citizen, there may be confusion based on someone's personal experiences or understanding of what that term means. So again, being as direct and specific as possible about you know, incarcerated person, um, person who was incarcerated. There was some interesting person first language conversations surrounding that. 
and whether we should always recommend person who's incarcerated or person who was formerly incarcerated over incarcerated person, formerly incarcerated person, um, putting the human before the term. But sometimes, um, you know, sometimes you need to default to brevity. And the majority of the sources we looked at, you know, kind of substantiated that it was okay to use both terms based on the context. Okay, so let's stop and check for some questions and see what we've got. Okay, so, so, so. I'm gonna shift away from the screen share um, so that we can chat a little bit. Um, Jessica had asked, what are the headings for the columns? Don't worry, there is actually an at a glance chart that those were all um, like, from that uh, you can find in the um, glossary itself, but it's the, we definitely used um, red, green, and yellow. So the red is kind of avoid, the green is the recommended, the yellow is the use with caution, use with specificity, use when it makes the most sense. So we're running a little bit low on time. Um, we have a couple of interactive activities, and I'm going to punt back to Chuck here and say, Chuck, do we want to do interactive or do we want to send those out and allow folks to just kind of like do the interactive on their own afterward if they'd like to? I think with how much time we have, let's see if there's additional questions or comments from the audience and use this time as a large group rather than try to rush through the interactive activities and not feel like we have time to do them justice. I love that plan. So we will send you the, the interactive activities um, because really what they were doing is giving you a chance to practice with the glossary and kind of to look at real news articles and think, how would I rewrite that? Or how would I help change that narrative? How would I re-educate that reporter um, or that individual to help them do a better job the next time that they're working on this kind of story? Um, so we'll send those out and allow you to still be able to kind of work on those. But as Chuck said, would love your questions, comments. We can share the glossary link. I'm sure it's already been shared in the chat, but we can share it again. So it's like right there for you. If you want to take a look at that, ask us any questions about the process or some of the specifics and nuances, we would love to chat a little bit more about that. So you can go ahead and put your question in the chat or you can use the raise hand feature and we can do this as a more open-ended piece. And we've got the first question from Amanda Sch Schmidt. Is there any language surrounding a shared vocabulary regarded segregation, isolation, et cetera? So Kate, did you wanna take this or did you want me or I know- um, I can this is also Go for it. <laughs> no, <laughs> but- um, we already have a list of like kind of glossary 2.0 or uh you know second second version of the glossary um and that's absolutely so if you have ideas or words or terms or topics that you would like to see addressed please tell us that is incredibly important to us is that it reflects what you actually want or need so also as you're using the glossary um please tell us what else you need very much appreciate that. Um, one of the biggest ones we really struggled with was um, how, do, like, was language surrounding um, uh, any form of, like, victim slash survivor slash, um, so, and just all of the nuances of that one, and we were like, this could take we could debate this for years. So we're gonna just pin in that for 2.0. Um, but yeah, so I think that um, any of those terms that you would find helpful, please let us know. We would very much appreciate that. And this is a take where on isolation, confinement, et cetera, this is a, where I tend to 
look at the work that unblock the box because these are all euphemisms for solitary confinement which as generally practiced in the united states is a form of torture so that is we look to them you know beverly is talking about opioid addict again i'd probably use people first rather than addict right so because there are people who have addictions but their addiction does not fully define them so but yes it is you know that that is a that you know addiction is a disease and we should be having uh compassion rather than stigma for people with that we had a question from emily in the chat how do you approach correcting or educating other people's language uh I, this is also something where we can you know i'm going to actually take us off spotlight so if, if anybody else wants to join in on this conversation for our last couple of minutes we can have this a little we're a smaller group now we've lost a couple of people after the first hour um so I am. I would love if other people have uh, additional comments on this. We designed the the glossary as to be uh, a tool for how we choose our own language, um, rather than necessarily a way to try to police other people's language. Um, for me, this question on that said, sometimes people's language can be hurtful, and. For me, it a lot of it depends on what that intention is and what the relationship is. Often I will, well, you actually just saw me, right? Just just correct language in there. You know, with when Beverly put that opioid addict in there, I know that what from that Beverly's on this call, right? Like her goal was reducing stigma. We have a shared goal of compassion and respect for people who are facing addiction and making sure they get the care they need, not the criminalization. So there it was easy to say, like, to just say, hey, because we had that relationship. If somebody is in a situation where there is, you know, maybe not starting with that shared respect and shared understanding of commitments, kind of the point that uh, Josh was making with the writer for, they used to be with the Marshall Project, where if she writes uh, pers incarcerated person instead of prisoner, she's going to get uh, written off in Texas because people think that she's just, it's just some sort of woke thing. So she's using that language. She's thinking through what is my goal and how do I be most intentional about that? So I would be, my practice is one, especially if it's something where there may be some defensiveness. Uh, I will often talk to somebody outside of the space, especially if it's direct feedback. So I didn't Very do that awesome. with Beverly, sorry. But like do it out where there's not gonna be um, defensiveness of like, now I look bad in front of people and start with a common goal. Right, like our goal, okay, let's use um, formerly incarcerated versus ex-con. Our goal is that when if people come out of prison, that they are able to get their life together and stay out of trouble, right? We've got that shared goal. Well, here's the thing. If we just label them as an ex-con or an ex-felon or something like that, that's going to hang over around their neck. It's going to be harder to get a job, harder to get an apartment. They're not going to be able to get the stability where they're able to give back to our community and it puts us all at risk. So we're identifying that shared goal before getting into the language question. So that's how I tend to approach uh, feedback. This is one that I am also particularly passionate about. Um, I've, uh, I work a lot in the DE&I space and you, I mean, you certainly have to read the room, right? Like Chuck said, in some instances, that is going to be better received or better heard if it's one-on-one -on -one, um, privately uh, because there is a lot of you know shame or defensiveness. On the other hand, in spaces where it's very normalized, I went to a really great training <laughs> where the individual um, who was talking about how do you like correct in everyday conversation <laughs> and um, his whole thing was, you got a little racism in your teeth. So basically like, like how you would just say to someone like, oh, you got a little spinach in your teeth, like oh, a little food right there. Can you just like, and you literally say, oh, you got a little racism in your teeth. And like, everybody knows like, oh, it wasn't, oh, that wasn't the intent. Oh, sh oh, thanks for pointing that out. And it's like a very, like, if you can create, if you're in control of the culture and you can create that culture, I do very frequently, like I do the, oh, mm -mm. Nope. If people see me start doing this on a like Zoom, they're like, oh, I just said something. What did I say that I, oh, that was bad. Sorry. 
Um, so some of it is when you can control the culture and some of it is when you can't control the culture. But then when it gets to these bigger macro issues, I'll also include this in the materials we share out. Um, but I uh, went through a really phenomenal, if anyone ever wants to go through a really phenomenal uh, DEI uh, course, I did a leadership in DEI uh, course or certification through Northwestern University, best training I've ever been a part of in my life. But they um, are one of our uh, professors, Dr. Tillery, was actually uh, the, the inventor of the creed model. Um, and it is just so, it's, it's just, oh, okay, I'll share it with you more. But creed is common purpose, research, equanimity, empathy, and deliverables. And it's basically looking at how you um, can get people to change their minds, attitudes, and opinions on like core things, race ethnicity, gender, um, core deep-seated stereotypes or um, injustices. And it's all research and evidence-based, but this, you know, common purpose. So like, like Chuck said, we start with what the goal is. And then on that bigger context, right, like you present the research and you have like part of the model is that it's most effective when done in this very specific order. Then there's equanimity which means that you have to give the other person equal respect of their opinion, even if you vehemently disagree with them and think that it is a human rights violation and there's no possible way they could be correct. You have to be willing to be equitable. And then um, empathy, so you show empathy um, and then you deliverables is where you talk about the actual opportunities for change. So the creed model is another great macro level way of doing that. And we will include a link to that in the resources we send out after this. I wanna thank you again, Kate, for all of you and your team's hard work to put the glossary together. I wanna thank our new program coordinator, Cozine Welch, who has been quietly in the background making all of the tech and pieces work. So thank you, Cozine. Uh, big thanks to our panelists, uh, Josh Ho, Alexandra Bailey, and Jason Smith for their insight that they shared with us today and the amazing work they do in the field. Uh, our work within Michigan Collaborative 10 Mass Incarceration, yes, it's about to resource you around language and being effective that way. It is also about helping us be able to show more unity and accomplish more with collective action. Just a couple of things I want to let you know that are in the pipeline for that. Um, well, one, one of the issues that we have worked with uh, Piper and Gold on is this issue of vital documents for people who are coming home from prison, right? So if somebody comes home and they don't have their birth certificate, they don't have their state ID or driver's license, the ability to get a job, the ability to get an apartment is almost none. Uh, so um, we are working with some of our partners like the State Appellate Defender's Office, Michigan, um, the Nation Outside Organization and the Center for Employment Opportunities to push some legislation that would help ensure that we get as close to 100% of people coming home with their vital documents as we can. I just dropped the link to the opinion piece that Piper and Gold helped us place. We are expecting uh, hearings on those documents within the next month uh, within, within those bills. So when you get back to that join link, when you join, it'll be a chance for you to get uh, kept up to date with those hearings, as well as other opportunities to get involved. You heard Alex Bailey here on the sent from the Sentencing Project. One of the partnerships that the Sentencing Project is working with us, American Friends Service Committee, Safe and Just Michigan, and a lot of partners from across the state on, is what's called second look legislation. That if somebody's serving time for something that they did and they've already put in 10 years, the chance that they're going to reoffend if they come home is almost zero. And so we should have a chance to look back at the people who are serving these egregiously long prison sentences and say, hey, did the punishment really fit the crime? Right now, there's not a way to give that, that look back. If somebody has a long minimum sentence, it could be 40 years before they ever get a chance even to see the parole board. This legislation would give them that second look, that chance to say, you know, I, I've changed, I can come back to the community, let me see the parole board. We are expecting to have a launch for that 
effort on, I believe, April 12th in Lansing. We're confirming the details now. So again, hit that. Uh, if this were a YouTube video, I'd say hit that like and subscribe. Instead, I'm going to say go to the website and click that join bit join button so that we can keep you in the loop there. And finally, you know, when we're talking about sentencing and reentry, those are the, the tail end of our criminal legal system, our system of mass incarceration. There is a lot of exciting work that's happening on the front end. Kate mentioned the great work that Advance Peace is doing in Lansing. There's groups like that that are doing violence intervention, restorative justice, police accountability, alternative emergency response. So if somebody is in a substance use or mental health crisis, it's a behavioral health specialist going there with the skills to diffuse the situation, give somebody treatment rather than a cop with a gun who's, that's not their core skill set. We're exploring setting up a learning community so that participants across the state who are involved in these efforts can learn from each other, compare notes, figure out how they get funding, how they get past uh, opposition from police or law enforcement. How do we support each other? Because really we are, even though we may be working in different geographies, different parts of the criminal legal system, we are all pushing for safe communities that reduce the harm of our system of mass incarceration. So again, uh, go to the website, join, check out our social media. We'll be giving more information about that shortly. Think and finally, thank you all for your involvement. You could have had plenty of other things you could have done with your time, but you're here today because you care, you're here doing the work, and you're making a difference. And for that, I am so grateful. All right. And we will be getting that information out to you shortly. I'm going to go ahead and save that chat so we get your questions for round two of the glossary. And with that, enjoy your day.